Hello, Mr. Pennell. Thank you for joining us today and giving us the opportunity to ask you some key questions about some of the issues currently facing Georgia. Now, we're speaking at a moment in time when the U.S.'s role in Georgia is being challenged through a persistent media campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, while criticism, even harsh one, is a legitimate part of the political debate and mm -hmm. U.S. policy is certainly not immune to them, it's happening for the first time in Georgia that not only is such criticism originating from the ruling majority, but it is actually rehashing some of the usual lines of Russian and other authoritarian states as propaganda. Now, a prominent example of this is the latest letter of the four MPs who left the Georgian Dream Party to found the anti-Western People Power Movement. Now, their letter, which was actually published on the parliament's official website, questioned whether the, whether the blood price that Georgia has paid is not higher than the cumulative U.S. assistance. Now, that also said that, and I quote, that the U.S. spends taxpayer dollars in Georgia having in mind a specific role that the country must play under the U.S. embassy diktat. The only function they have for us is containing Russia. It is for that function that they have been preparing Georgia and Ukraine for years. But the government of Georgia refused to destroy our country. So the Americans cannot forgive this, end quote. Without wanting to give too much credence to these four, we have actually been covering how the ruling party chairman riffs on the same line. So I'd like to ask you, why do you think that this is happening and what is your response? First of all, thank you very much for having me here on your program. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, the one thing I wanted to say initially was uh, we have 30 years of very strong cooperation between the people of the United States and the people of Georgia. And we here are to support the people of Georgia and their aspirations towards Euro-Atlantic integration. Um, in my short time here, I've had the opportunity to meet with a number of people uh, here in Tbilisi, outside in the different regions as well. And I'd say across the board and from my meetings with, with the Speaker of Parliament, with ministers and deputy ministers, including the Vice Prime Minister, with the business community, uh, with civil society organizations. Uh, across the board, there's been very strong uh, interest in continuing a very good partnership between the United States and Georgia. Uh, also, our ambassador, because it is a 30-year anniversary of cooperation between the United States and Georgia, um, and all of her travels throughout all the country, throughout all the regions, she continues to hear statements directly from the Georgian population that they want to continue on the tra trajectory towards the West. And so this contradicts what we are hearing in such statements as this, and it's unfortunately uh, leading to more polarization in the society. Um, we've had excellent cooperation between USAID and, and a range of different institutions in Georgia, and we look forward to continuing that cooperation. Um, I have to say I've been highly impressed by the capacity of the Georgian people uh, in the business sector, uh, young entrepreneurs, also civil society activists, um, also um, in government as well. Um, we've been working here, as I said, for 30 years. And um, one thing I want to highlight in terms of you know, the value of our assistance, that's just uh, you know, to give an idea of scale, but really what we focus on is impact and what we've actually been doing with our assistance. So through our cooperation, we've helped to establish a new curriculum for elementary schools. We've helped to train judges. Uh, we've helped to create better paying jobs. We've helped uh, farmers and other entrepreneurs meet standards for exporting to the European Union. And there are many other examples as well. And this is something that we're able to continue to do and something we do in very close cooperation uh, with the government of Georgia. Um, and all of our assistance is publicly available and we do it in a very transparent and very competitive way. Uh, I can cite our different websites where information about the work we do is publicly available, how we do it. But really, uh, it's unfortunate that, that, that these uh, attacks continue because we are here really to support the people of Georgia. And our understanding is they also want our partnership. And so we're here to do that. Great. Thank you. Um, to that end, I'd like to turn now to civil society, which is another key part of Georgia. Now, much has been written lately by the Carnegie Foundation and the German Marshall Fund about shrinking civic space. Mm -hmm. We, too, have actually been covering how the Georgian Dream Party has launched a campaign against civil society organizations to discredit them. 
Now, this campaign is actually built around keywords like rich NGOs, non-transparent clan of NGOs, and US-influenced NGOs. Significantly, these are not just words. Watchdogs like ISFED and Transparency International have actually been barred from participating in key reforms working groups created by the government. Now, USAID actually has been supporting Georgia civil society, both directly and indirectly, through its projects for years now. So I'd like to ask you, what has been the USAID objective in this sense? What have been the results? And most importantly, how do you think that the donor community should react if these attempts to limit civic space continue? Uh, thank you very much. It's a very important question, and obviously something that we're also tracking very closely. Uh, for USAID, we do believe strongly in the United States very strongly that a vibrant civil society is a necessary uh, foundation of a very robust and transparent and inclusive democracy uh, across the world. We work to support civil society uh, in every country, not only in Georgia, even in the United States. We have our own civil society organizations, all of whom are advocating for the rights of people, the rights of citizens, uh, holding governments accountable to what they say they're going to do and responding to citizen needs. Whether that's uh, just in the last year alone, we work with over 100 different civil society organizations to ensure that children with special needs are, are, are getting the uh, support that they need from the government, uh, that in local communities, in terms of trash collection or potable water, and things that affect the environment, that those are being supported as well. Um, also that you know, Georgians who may not be able to afford legal services are provided with free legal aid uh, just in the last several years, we've been able to support uh, legal consultations for free uh, for over 90,000 Georgians. And the same support has helped uh, provide legal uh, representation in 14,000 court cases. This is what civil society does, and this is why they're so important. And, and another very important example is uh, we have a story uh, through one of our civil society uh, partners here where uh, trying to help Georgian children get to school into a good school is something that we're able to support. Uh, there was a, a child who lost his mother, who was a Georgian national. And his father was a Russian national and could not be located. And the grandmother wanted to take custody of the child, but was not able to initially uh, for legal reasons. And through a civil society organization who was advocating on the rights of the child, was able to work uh, legally to overturn a decision that was going to bar the child from attending school and now the child is able to live with his grandmother and attend a school. And so civil society does these types of things. And that's why it's so important, uh, not just in Georgia, but all over the world. And it's something that we're going to continue uh, to support. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's turn now to media freedom and disinformation, two topics that are interrelated. Now, many observers have written about Georgia's extremely polarized TV media landscape, mm -hmm. while also pointing out that quite different, mm -hmm. quite vibrant, independent public interest journalism is alive and well, both in the regions and among online media outlets that, among other things, try to actually tackle hostile disinformation. Now, I know that USAID has its own anti-disinformation program, which has been running for quite a while now and that a new USAID media program has just launched as well. What is USAID's strategy? What are you trying to support in this field and how? Thank you. This is also another very, very critical question. Unfortunately, polarization, disinformation are issues that affect the entire globe, including in my own country, the United States. And it's something that we're very eager to help uh, in, in Georgia, as we do in many other countries as well, uh, to, to help protect uh, the information space from disinformation, from, from propaganda. And the way we do that is to help support independent journalists and media outlets with providing fact-based information that's produced uh, through ethical means. And uh, something we've been doing for several years and something we'll continue to do. Um, it's also something that's important, you know, particularly outside the, in the regions where in some minority areas, they may not uh, speak the Georgian language. So we're also able to provide uh, information and, and native language to uh, minority populations also get information. And then also to those regions near the administrative boundary line, that they're able to get, uh, you know, fact-based, ethically produced uh, information that, you know, is otherwise unavailable due to the amount of Russian uh, media and disinformation that is out there. Um, interestingly enough, just in the last couple of weeks, I also participated in a 
what we call a, a disinformation innovation competition. It's the second one we've done. Uh, we've done it two years in a row now, which highlights first the incredible entrepreneurship uh, of you know, the young Georgian population. Um, it gives them an opportunity to, to showcase you know, different information technology skills they have, uh, which can then be used to potentially not just counter disinformation uh, and improve media literacy here in Georgia, but also gives them an opportunity to export their ideas internationally. So it also provides a potential income generation uh, opportunity for them, uh, particularly if it's like a social media analysis tool, uh, if it's other like public database aggregators. So there is quite a lot of effort uh, mm -hmm. in this, and we see tremendous potential among the Georgian population in this space. Thank you. Uh, now, for those who know USAID programming well, mm -hmm. I think it's obvious that in these past years, a lot of attention has been given to fostering synergies. So classical civil society support projects integrate market elements, youth activism goes hand in hand with mm -hmm. employment, and so on. I really want to know why this approach, what have you managed to achieve with it already? And significantly, does it mean that USAID is also changing internally? Again, thank you for this question. So certainly our approach to the private sector has evolved over time. Uh, we see that there's a lot of interest in the private sector to partner with us, you know, globally and including here in Georgia, of course. You know, engaging the private sector provides a lot of opportunity to promote like greater innovation. Uh, greater sustainability of our work, and also to help here in particular uh, support more inclusive economic growth. And so just uh, in the last week, I had an opportunity to attend uh, with the head of the National Skills Agency of Georgia, the Deputy Minister of Education and Science, and also the, the Regional Director and the Country Director for UN Women, where we launched a new program uh, working at least initially in 17 different areas like information communication technology, uh, tourism and hospitality, uh, nursing, uh, automotive industry, construction, port development, etc., uh, where we brought in the private sector with these different entities to help identify the skills that are needed to help modernize the workforce further here in Georgia. And also it's important to note, at least in the nursing industry, uh, having uh, the nursing uh, sector, if you will, that has the qualifications and certifications needed uh, is also a requirement related to EU membership. So that's something very uh, critical as well. We've been partnering with, with uh, geo hospitals on that. In addition to that, we recently uh, signed a new agreement with TBC Bank, which is a $30 million loan portfolio guarantee, which would actually provide uh, uh, loans to micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, particularly those owned or managed by women and those outside of the major cities and rural areas. And so the expectation is that this program will help lead to 10,000 new jobs and over 100 million in new sales. So it's another great potential uh, economic opportunity. And we're able to do this through private sector cooperation. We also have good uh, agreements with not just TBC Bank, but also British Petroleum and also the Ajar Group, among others. And so there's tremendous value in working in the private sector to uh, work together, identify needs, and leverage the expertise that they provide. Thank you for that answer. Uh, the developments that we've been talking about so mm -hmm. far, I think really confirm the importance mm -hmm. of Georgia's independent agencies, such as the Public right. Defender's Office and the State Audit Office. Now, new and expected new leadership within those agencies mm -hmm. can bring about a lot of uncertainty about their future. So I'd like to ask you, how are USAID's programs promoting the independence and effectiveness of these agencies? Well, um, as we are doing with civil society as kind of an independent uh, you know, actor in the political space, it's something that we continue to support uh, with the Public Defender Office and also the state audit organization as well. Um, we're very proud of our work with both of them. I, I would say with Public Defender Office, I've had some very good engagements with the Public Defender and with her team. And they're really an important independent organization to help ensure that the government is being responsive to the rights of citizens. And their work has, has been really critical in terms of responding to different cases. And they're trying to do that on, on a more uh, you know, responsive and, and quicker basis, if you will. Um, and it's really important that with the new selection process of the new public defender, that it's done in an impartial and transparent way. And that whoever is selected is somebody that's highly qualified and accepted by all parties and not just you know, the interest of one. 
And so that's something that we're also tracking closely, particularly uh, the European Union, as it is a requirement for uh, the EU membership status and in response to the 12 different recommendations. So that's very important. In terms of the state audit office as well, we understand that they have a new leader uh, who we'll be meeting with very shortly. Um, I'm very happy the work we've done with the state audit office in the last, let's say, 10 or 11 years. Um, mm -hmm. Just like the PDO, their job is to provide an independent kind of watchdog role into ensuring that uh, how government money is being managed and spent is done in a transparent way. And we'll continue to, you know, engage with them as another independent institution of government. And we're happy that our own U.S. Government Accountability Office, or GAO, has been a partner in this. And so uh, we look forward to continuing that effort as well. Great. Well, thank you so much once again for joining us today. And we look forward to having the chance to speak with you again in the future. Likewise. Thank you very much as well. Thanks.